Look, this is a podcast for aspiring authors, new writers, and anybody who just wants to brush up on their skills. But one thing this show will always do is empower through candor. And in this episode of Horrible Writing, I'm going to be very candid with you and tell you why you shouldn't always listen to Twitter. That will that never, never work. work. You can't, can't publish, publish that. that. Seriously? No, 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 that's no, 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 no. Oh my God, that's bad. You, you probably, probably should find other hobbies. You ever, you ever learn how to sell? Stop. Stop. Be happy. Quit while you're in the middle. Don't bother me. I've seen better people. Do you really want to do And grow my third grade. Give it up. Welcome to Horrible Writing, the rawest, most candid, in-your-face writing show on the interwebs because none of us have time to suck. Let's do this. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 74 of Horrible Writing. I'm your host, Paul Sading, broadcasting from snowy Washington State. I can say that and brag about it because it doesn't happen very often. In my half a decade of living here, we've had a handful of snow days, and the snow usually, on the best of those instances, lasts for maybe a day or two and accumulates to about three inches. And we've received about three feet in the last couple days, and unfortunately, true to Washington and its nature, We are seeing the rains move in in February, and it's all going away, which kills this central New York heart of mine. Uh, I've enjoyed it. My neighbors have complained. Everybody in my life has complained about it who lives here, and I feel like a kid again, building those snowmen in upstate New York or snowmobiling and all those wonderful things I used to do that I can no longer do anymore. But hey, I enjoyed it while it was here. And that's what counts. Enjoying things while you have them. Like your writing. A lot of you who listen to this show are new writers. Newer writers. Maybe just got published. Maybe only have a few books, uh, like me, published. Maybe you don't even care about publishing. You just love the craft of writing. And you want to do more of it. You want to tell stories. The stories that are in your head, the stories that are in your heart. That's beautiful. One thing you will never hear on this show is me telling you you can't go do that. I want you to do it. I want everybody to do it. One of the reasons why I broke and I gave in to author S.L. Barron's request to start a horrible writing Facebook group Uh, which she bugged me to do for like a year, (laughs) it was because I wanted more voices and I wanted to do my part in providing a platform for more voices. So you got this show, and if this show works and jives for you and your writing approach, definitely head over to Facebook and search for the Horrible Writing Writer Support Group because, again, it's a collective of us and It's, you know, non-promo, non-buy-my-book crap. I don't do any of that. It's all about us lifting each other up and helping each other. But additionally, talking to aspiring author Natalie Ackid from that group, she started a wonderful writing challenge each month, not a contest, a challenge, that really helps us stretch ourselves as writers because she gives us a prompt and three criteria that our stories within 500 words has to meet. It's pretty impressive to even for me to even pull off a story under her criteria. She really stretches us. And I love that. As a writer, do you take opportunities to stretch yourself, your writer self, and write something that you wouldn't normally write? Do you step outside of your genre and try a different genre? Do you try a different angle? 
Do you try to write in different POVs or from a different character's eyes, from their perspective? I don't see how any of us can become better writers if we're not doing those things. I could write a season of Subject Found, turn around and adapt that podcast to a novel a couple times a year probably. I could do it over and over and over again. And it might not make me that much better of a writer. The more I write, the more I'll improve. But staying in that genre with that approach over the time may stunt my growth. I don't know because I'm not going to try it. And even so, in that show, there's three stories. Two of them, you audio drama fans have heard. They're out there now, season one and season two. POV from a male, straight male. And then the second season was a POV from a female. The third season, which may never see the light of day because of funding issues, but the book will, the POV is from the perspective. I'm trying to be careful how I say this because uh, there's a neat little plot twist to it, So even in the character and who the character is. But it's a young female with a disability. I don't have a disability. I am not female. I am not LGBTQ. I have family who are, who I love dearly. I have family across the spectrum. Different races, ethnicities, believe it or not. Different identities. I have public knowledge of those people, but I am not those people. But they don't write, and I do. And I'll just be straight up. I love people, and I want to tell different stories. Not only from a selfish perspective as a writer, I don't want to be in a straight white male's head all the time. God, how boring is that? From a writing perspective and a reading perspective. But I want to be able to help put a little piece of their story out into the world. And I need those of you who picked up on that to run that over in your head again. And those of you who didn't, I need you to rewind and hear that. I want to put a little piece of their story into the world. I don't want to put their story because I can never speak to their story. But I can put pieces of their story into the world. And I think that's important to do. There's a, there's a social reason why I do it as well. I don't want to get into uh, identity politics because I think it's one of the most toxic diseases of our t- modern times. Um, the, the separation and just the toxicity in the world is caused because I feel people allow themselves to be sucked into a specific identity because that's what they're supposed to do because that's what's expected of them based on X, Y, Z. And I resist that. I don't agree with it and I resist it for myself. I agree that it happens. All you have to do is open up the internet and you'll see it. But that mindset, I think, is the empowerment statement for this episode. That you do have the allowance and, dare I say, the responsibility to go tell slices of other people's stories. I can imagine some of the people looking at their phone right now, or yelling at their car speakers. But, sorry, you can disagree with me until the end of time. It doesn't matter and you're not going to change my mind. You, whoever you are, nebulous, ill-slash-undefined antagonist in this story of this episode, you don't get to tell me what I can and cannot write. I will not spend the next decades of my life writing stories from a straight white male perspective. I will and have written female characters, a lot of them. I actually happen to love writing from a female perspective. I think it's much more interesting for me personally and from a story perspective. You will not tell me I can't write gay characters. I already have and 
with great success, with lots of kudos and wonderful feedback. You can't tell me that I can't write non-white characters. Mm, Because I can, I have, and again, get tons of kudos for those stories that do. You basically can't tell me who I can and can't write. You never will be able to. Now, for those of you who are gripping that steering wheel really tight or who are about to shut off this episode because you're just so mad that I would say that, like I'm taking candy from someone else, I want to explain where I'm coming from and why I'm coming from here. As writers, we have a responsibility. As humans, we have a responsibility to tell stories. Stories reflect our lives, not just singularly on the micro level, but on the macro level. What we create today, 100 years from now, will be defining for those people who are alive then what the world was like nowadays. There are people, even though the barriers to publishing, the barriers to podcasting, all of those things have been reduced to a minimum level, there are still some barriers. Some of them socioeconomic that I'm not going to be able to solve on this podcast. But assuming that someone can overcome those barriers barriers to write a book, to write a story, flash fiction, to write an episode of a podcast or a, an entire podcast, podcast. We are here to celebrate and support them. And where those stories touch us, where we find inspiration in the real world, we have a responsibility to the macro level, to those stories that will live long past our own physical form, to tell them. My first LGBTQ story was called Salt and Pepper. It was a short story. Two young women in a restaurant setting, only seen in that story. I wrote it to honor two people in my life who are gay, and I love them dearly. It is a story from my heart, the deepest, darkest reaches of my heart, my pain for them. If I listened to LGBTQ people who told me I can't write gay characters, that story wouldn't exist. And I wouldn't have been able to give it to those two people who mean far more to me than the trolls on the internets telling me I can't write those things. Conversely, it fills my heart with joy when I heard from those people and how much they loved that story, and how much it meant to them. I wrote May's Flowers. You can hear it now. It's on the Who Killed Julie podcast feed. It was basically my little giveaway to the Who Killed Julie audience to see if any of them would want to patron me so I can go create the follow-on to that story. It's a short story about an elderly black woman. Her whole story, going back to Depression-era America. I did that and used my experiences of living around the world, and especially living in the Deep South, and seeing, in modern times, the disgusting disparity and apathy between races in America's Deep South. And that bothered me. And I loved May. I fell in love with May. Elderly black woman. I'm a middle-aged white man. And I fell in love with her. And that's okay. We want to love. I want to love. I want to love all people. Well, except for toxic people. But (laughs) them aside. And I truly do. May is probably one of my favorite characters of all time. And her story is incredibly powerful for me. It encompassed a lot of those things that I saw while I lived in Alabama. And to have someone like Ashley Litzy, who is Emerald Johnson, the the character Emerald Johnson in Who Killed Julie, also be able to narrate that story. She's a black woman. 
have her voice on that story. You can hear the emotion in her voice as she's reading this. And I'm not going to tell you what she said when she recorded the story, but it moved her. That's my validation right there. Now, I say all of this, and I'm going to bring it to close with one more example that I really want to share with you because it's a very recent example, and it really hits at something that bothers me a lot. Officially next week, I hope, or maybe even this week, we'll, at some point I hope we'll all learn, that I'm going to make an announcement about my audio drama future. And I'll tell you now here as, as an exclusive to the horrible writing community. I'm stepping away from audio drama. I'm not going to do it anymore, at least for the foreseeable future. There's many reasons to that. The financial aspect of it and the cost and time is the main driver. I can overcome a lot of things, almost everything, but that is the huge limiting factor on my future in audio drama. I'm not going to do it publicly. I will still give my patrons two exclusive audio dramas. One they're already getting, which is a choose your own adventure audio drama, which is really cool. And then my epic fantasy crown of thieves is going to be for patrons only. The public is not going to get that audio drama because again, like I told you at the 2019 message, I'm at peace with how much content I've given away for free. I've proven myself. Nearing a million million downloads, I don't need to prove myself anymore. I need to respect myself, my art, and those people who support me. And that's why I want to share that with them in audio drama form while I'm working on the novels, the novel series. But that's not the only reason I'm stepping away. Audio drama is a interesting medium, especially for a middle-aged white man, straight white man. It's not exactly a healthy environment, and it's very cliquish, especially uh, the in-group, out-group stuff. And I've decided, you know what? I'm too old, and I don't have the energy to be around toxicity anymore. And the last few years of my life, I've done a masterful job of cutting out toxicity from my life because it doesn't help me, my creative mind, my creative spirit. So I don't feel drawn to that anymore. And it's unfortunate because I have a lot of fun doing it. But again, you have to do a cost-benefit analysis on everything in life if you, if you want to prioritize. And the costs of remaining outweigh the benefits of staying. Associated to that, the main driver of audio drama popularity is not the quality of writing. I've got plenty of stories I, I'm going to share in future episodes about exa- non-examples of writing, yet still being very successful in audio drama. It's not the quality of production. There's plenty of crappy sounding audio drama out there that does quite well. It's more of the in-group, out-group. Are you like us? Yes or no. If you are, we support you. If you're not, we ignore you or are outright hostile to you and work to exclude you. A lot of that comes from the two drivers of audio drama's audience, Reddit and Twitter. And her body wasn't found for two years blogger Emerald Johnson is hired to investigate Julie's story and in this seven part series you learn more about Julie, who she was as a person and those who were part of her story those who loved her those who hurt her and those who would do anything for her it's the story of Julie it's the story of us Find it on any of your podcatchers, Spotify, and iHeartRadio today.
Now, here's the big payoff for those of you who hung around this long in this episode. I want to give you a recent real-world example of why you don't want to listen to Twitter when it comes to your stories. Even if you're in the demographic of most Twitter users. Social media is an echo chamber. We migrate towards those who are like us, who think like us, who talk like us, who project similar messages as we do. The minute we find out someone is the antithesis to that, we fade away, block, mute, cut off contact with those people reinforcing the echo chamber. Those of you who are writers who don't spend a lot of time on Twitter, good. Twitter doesn't move books. You need to be there. You need to be establishing your tribe out there. But you don't need to invest a whole lot of time out there, especially if you're susceptible to toxicity as I am. Those of you who have followed me for a long time have seen a drastic reduction in my Twitter presence. I essentially go on one account instead of the eight I have. I check through the mentions real quick and post something and then get out of there. I don't hang out. I don't scroll. And I have started slowly building lists on Twitter so I can at least stay in contact with those people I care about without being exposed to those I don't. Twitter being an echo chamber, that it is, and it definitely is, there's also social components to Twitter. I set all of this up to tell you about my recent experience that just drove home something I'd been feeling for a very long time. That Twitter doesn't know what the fuck it's talking about. Here's what I mean. In an upcoming episode, episode four of my new community podcast, The Stories We Tell, So if you are a writer and you are part of the Horrible Writer Writing Support Group on Facebook, you know about these monthly challenges, those stories being selected from that monthly challenge, being part of this new podcast called The Stories We Tell, a podcast for all voices. And I mean that, for all voices. In episode four, which will be coming out in spring of 2019, the challenge we were given and the prompt we were given by Natalie was a struggle for me, but I had one story in my head I wanted to write. And I didn't know if I ever would be able to. And then she gave us this prompt with this criteria. And I said, boom, there's the story. There's, here's the opportunity to try this story. Now in this story, the character, the narrator, if you will, through whose eyes we see the story, is transgendered. Again, I am not. I wrote this story and got it out. Got it out of my system. Edited it a little bit and submitted it to this challenge. But in the meantime, well, before I submitted it, in the meantime between the challenge and uh, putting it in the future episode of The Stories We Tell, I did what all writers should do when you're writing the other. I talk to people who are smarter than me about the issue of life as transgender. I reached out to eight people and shared that story with them. Seven of those eight people responded quickly within the day and positively. They loved the story. They loved the character and the protagonist. They loved the conflict. And best of all, they said in their own comments, again, these are all transgender people. They said in their own comments that I really captured what their experience was like. One person did not. One person 
wrote me feedback that was actually longer than the story itself, and then concluded that feedback with essentially a call to action or a call to non-action for me to basically stay in my lane and not write things that aren't part of my experience. Guess where that person came from? (laughs) No, I took to all social media for this call to get sensitivity readers for this transgender story. I wanted transgender sensitivity readers. Seven out of eight, I don't do public math, I don't know what the percentage is, seven out of eight complimented the story. More importantly, they said it was spot on. I had done well with that transgender character's story. And they had no problems, literally not a single problem from seven out of the eight people. And they span all age ranges into, from teens all the way into 50s. Their 50s. The one person who had the problem who wrote the extensive diatribe and then told me basically to not tell transgender stories came from Twitter, which those of you who use Twitter a lot won't be shocked by. And therein is my point to you. This podcast and this horrible writing community exists for writers. I don't do this show and I don't spend all that time serving as an administrator to a Facebook group, one of my least favorite activities in the world, because of anything other than my belief that I saw a void in the writing community where people could be real, candid, raw, yet supportive and empowering of each other. Each other. This isn't to say I don't care about readers or fans. I do. I love the people who read my stuff who listen to my podcast, who give me feedback, who, who buy my books, love them to death. They're some, very, some of the most, the most kind people in the world that I know. But this podcast is not for them. So in that, my message isn't meant for them to empower and support them. It's for you, the writer. If you are going to write the other, and again, I feel it is our duty to write characters who aren't us all the time, over and over and over again. Think in context. Now, if you are a marginalized person, your it, it may it may be a calling to write more marginalized person fiction, people like you. And I get that. And there's a very, very important element to why you would want to do that. In your writing, if you're here, if you're a if you're not a straight white male, in your writing at some point, it would behoove you as a writer, it would behoove your craft to step out and to try to write a straight white male. And guess what? I'm not gonna get pissed about it. I'm not gonna get mad or upset. If you mess some things up, and you probably won't, not, not, not in that respect. And, and that's the thing. All of us, when it comes to writing the other, if our intentions are pure and good, and if we are responsible to this story, that fictional person's story, to do our reading, to do our homework, and then write a good story, steering clear of unfair crap and lazy writing, and then we employ the tactic of multiple sensitivity readers, and we listen to them, and we don't defend our story, but we listen to what they have to say, then we can publish with peace of mind. I have no idea how people will receive that story when they hear it or what they'll think about that story or if it even is a blip on their radar screen. But I know it was an important story because I, again, I'm a humanist. People above all, except for dogs. Dogs are awesome. But people, people, good people are why I tell stories. And I want to tell a lot of stories, a lot of different kinds of stories. 
and damn anybody who's going to tell me I can't. There's space for me to do it. I'm going to do it. Just like there's space for you in your stories. Do it. Write those stories. Get off Twitter because Twitter doesn't know what it's talking about. It's an echo chamber, often filled with loud, angry, frustrated people who are feeding off each other and don't know squat all about what you're doing. If, if they could write your story, they would not be on Twitter writing 42 long p- post or tweet posts. They would be writing your story, and they're not. <laughs> those who do write, those who can't tweet, <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't cling to them and their opinions because their opinions are just that, and that's all they should be taken for. Be responsible to the story, to the slice of someone else's story, to the social cultural norms and roles. Be critical of how you're telling that story and how you're telling that character's story and you sensitivity readers. And you'll be at peace. In fact, happy ending to my story, by the way. One of the sensitivity readers who gave me feedback on the story has actually asked to voice it. And she's going to. And I'm super humbled you know, those of you who are artists, I think you'll get it, especially humanist artists, you'll get it. To have her ask me, hey, if you ever want this story narrated, you know, please reach out to me. I would be honored to. For her to say that she would be honored to narrate my story, that's crazy. I'm honored that she would want to be narrating the story. And therein lies the win. That's why I can do this episode. This is why I can be so raw and candid, and you can probably hear some of my passion in my voice in this episode. Because if I stopped and listened to all the naysayers on that toxic medium of Twitter, there's a lot of things I wouldn't have tried. And I see that very often, especially from younger writers, I see it very often that Twitter determines their worldview. And That ain't going to fly in 2019 with me, not on horrible writing. I'm here for you. Twitter's drunk. It needs to go home. Stop listening to the people on Twitter tell you what you can and can't do. I hope this helps some of you feel empowered. If now is not the time for you to stretch into the other, totally cool. I've been writing on and off for 20 years. And I'm in my 40s. And I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this for love. And I'm much more comfortable basically not caring what people think than maybe a lot of people are. When I was in my 20s, I cared more than I do now. I don't care. Because people, the the loud people are often the people who don't know what they're talking about. They're loud because they're not based on actual fact or life experience. Uh, It's based on their raw emotion, their selfish raw emotion. This isn't me being apathetic to that person's comments and their feedback. They don't know me from anybody. They don't know my intentions. And it's a story that may have been very personal or they may have identified closely with that story. I I don't know. They had some good constructive stuff that I would consider were I to do another story, another, uh, a full, a more full story from a transgender perspective. I don't think I will. I don't, I don't feel comfortable. I I know I won't, at least for the next couple of years, because I don't feel comfortable doing that. Maybe as I read and research and learn more, I will. But again, this harkens back to the, my comment about being responsible. I don't feel responsible enough to tell a full story from a transgender perspective. This was a 500-word flash fiction piece. Anything beyond that, even a longer short story, I probably wouldn't have done. So who are you listening to? Who are you surrounding yourself with? There's an old mantra 
I use when I teach my leadership classes about you changing the tribe and the tribe changing you, that we are the result of the five people we spend the most time with. Who are you spending the most time with? Who is your tribe? How are they changing you? Are they changing you for the better? Something I ask you all to think about until you hear from me again. And before you go, or while, even while, even while you're leaving that rating and review for the show, (laughs) go tell the stories in your heart and keep being epic. This has been Horrible Writing, and hopefully after this episode, you suck less than you did at the beginning. I am Paul Sadin, your host, Extraordinaire. You can find me over on the Twitterverse at Writing Horrible and over at paulsadin.com forward slash horrible dash writing. Until next time, suck less. Yeah.